I came here today to see your face again. It might be the last. So let us make this right. Would not be proper to say our last goodbyes. It looks like we hit a fork in the road, and it seems that I can only fit on the path on the right, but you were left with the left one. Some might wonder why I came to see you again. A lot, a lot of people do not like what you did to me before I come back. Well, it's because behind this monster of madness, guilt, anger, and wrongdoing, I see a soft spot. I see what you truly are. I know that hiding in the darkness of fear and blame, there's true fatherly love. In the exact same spot, there's nurturing. <laughs> I believe that it can still be activated. We just need to excavate the corrupted parts of your heart. Most people think that I am sensitive when it comes to talking about you. That is true and false. I do want to talk about you. That's because I still love you. And I'll always love you. Until the end of my days. I just wanted to say that I wish you never things you never did the things you did to me. And it was just and I think that it was just a long dream. I wish I want to say that you never left. With when every day passes since we last made contact. I feel like everything is slowly taken away from me. I want to say I miss those brown eyes. I miss knowing what you're doing. I also miss knowing how your day has been. I keep on thinking about you, whether I'm in a good mood or not. When I said was fam I was family, I was something I really meant. I just wish you the best. I want to say that you are everything I needed all along. But Baba, I want you happy whether or not it's with me. I wanted to be with you, but that's something I wish I really meant. Right now you're facing heavy consequences, but I have something that I cannot change. My father was a good person who just really made a really serious mistake. He was not a bad parent. He worked in the medical field when I was a young age. We, want, we went all along, went on to out of country vacations such as Canada and France. He had a lot of friends. He had a positive impact on those around him. But we got to remember that a mistake was made and trauma lasts. It can burn through people's brains, souls, hearts, and destroying everything in its path. It creates pain. It creates suffering, it creates hate. And the last thing I want to do is hate. A lot of people dislike you because of your actions and some have feelings of hatred. However, I still love you and I will continue to love you for the rest of my days. But how do I feel about you? I feel sad, I feel sympathy, feel hope, but most importantly, I feel forgiveness. Other people may not think that, but I do. In that, I hope you can gather yourself and try to follow up on the consequences of your actions. Just remember that I'm still, still your son, no, no matter what, and always remember that I'm still a ferreter. And Judge Co Coates, I wish you could sentence my beloved father, Tim, six months jail time, five years probation. And I have, and true mercy is not just from the heart. It's the will of the victim to accept mercy that he has received for his wrongdoings. Thank you.
Your Honor, next I have a victim impact statement from Dr. Waller, and she's on Zoom. Okay. She's providing a victim impact statement, Your Honor. That's permissible. It's not. Objections overruled. Um, where is she in Zoom here? All right, Dr. Waller, raise your right hand, please. Do you swear to tell the truth? Or truth, nothing but the truth, self again. I do. All right, um, we may um, proceed with the statement. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I've been providing trauma therapy and support to Theodore Rona and Nola Berger since shortly before, I'm sorry, since shortly after they were removed from their parent, parent care and entered into the foster care system in February of 2022. The statement was approved by all three children, by all three of the Berger children, Rona, Fiona, and Nola. But I'm specifically um, here to talk about the impact that the Mr. Berger's behavior had on the Berger daughters. Trauma bonding is a process that occurs between a victim and a perpetrator. The victim becomes reliant on the perpetrator to meet their basic physiological needs. Your Honor, I'm sorry to interrupt this. Time passes. Oh, 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 hold on a sec, Doctor. I am going to object to relevance, Your Honor, as it relates to the victim impact of the daughters, as they are not listed victims in this case, and it's irrelevant. I believe that the only victim impact that would be relevant is um, RF. Response. The people consider broader impact for the purposes of sentencing. They provided numerous letters about all his good character, and so the impact of his actions, they want you to consider his good acts and the impact that he has had positively on the community, but they don't want you to consider the impact that he's had negatively. It is completely per uh, permissible consideration in a sentencing hearing. All right, the objection is overruled. I will continue to allow you to proceed with your statement, Dr. Waller. Thank you, Your Honor. The victim becomes reliant on the perpetrator to meet their basic physiological needs. As time passes, the victim becomes grateful to the perpetrator for allowing them to have the basic fundamental things that humans need to grow and to survive. Abused children are uniquely trauma bonded to their parent perpetrators. Children generally rely on their parents for their physiological needs. They also rely on their parents to provide for their safety, security, and love and belonging. As parents provide these essential tools, children learn to become social, safe, and independent. Most children who are abused and deprived of their fundamental needs by their parents start to develop neurobiological differences. Over the years, these children become conditioned to believe that the things that their parent perpetrator provides to them are normal. The victim believes they are loved, supported, and cared for despite the treatment that they're receiving, even when the situation is very different. The victim in return develops a deep love for their parent perpetrator, many times believing that they are to blame for any mistreatment or mistakes that have taken place on the parent perpetrator's part. The victim will defend their parent perpetrator to others and even take on a blame role for any behaviors that they believe are their fault. I've had the unique opportunity to process the Nola and Fiona Farragher, their beliefs, fears, tears, rationalizations, and realities about what has happened in their family. The hardest thing for the Farragher daughters is the ongoing betrayal that they feel. Each of them is depressed, anxious, and afraid. But mostly they have a deep sense of betrayal from their parents and extended family. They love their brother. They love their parents. Fiona and Nola both understand that Ronan is trauma bonded to their parents. They wonder how long it will take for Ronan to heal and for the trauma bonds to break. They both wonder if Ronan's trauma bonds will ever break or if their brother will even survive the abuse that he's endured. The betrayal that the girls have comes from the deep and relentless misrepresentation of their brother and his behaviors to the general community by their parents, the media, and their extended family. Over the past eight years, the girls have watched their brother lose a sense of himself, his happiness, and his freedom. They remember the lock outside the door when he was under eight. They remember when their parents first removed Ronan from the family home when he was about 10. This happened just after a new baby took his place and his bedroom. The girls remember Ronan put into the room, in the garage, locked from the outside. Fiona talks about remembering the locking, lights off, crying, lack of food, and no access to the bathroom, night after night. She remembers her brother scream as she listened to her father beat him, and then she'd hear knocking. She slept in silence, terrified, wondering if her brother was still alive on the other side of that wall. Over the past 
past 18 months, the girls have shared very different versions of how Ronan behaved in the family home, specifically about the incident circulating within the general news media. The fairer girls tell stories of three half as happy siblings under the age of five or six playing together. The fairer girls remember the injuries that Ronan allegedly inflicted on others, occurring during playtime together, not because of the calculated vengefulness that one sibling had for the other, but because they were children playing too rough. The girls remember Ronan taking the door off the hinges of the locked bedroom when he was around 10 years old. This incident was right before his parents moved him into the garage. They remember that Ronan was so tiny when he was 10. They wondered how he was able to get the door off the hinges. The girls remember the door falling on their mother, who was on the other side of the door. They remember Ronan trying to get out of his room to use the bathroom. These are the distorted stories that their friends read online and then look at them and wonder about at school. The girls didn't understand what was happening to Ronan at first, but they developed their autonomy. As they developed their autonomy, they began to question why their parents treated their brothers so differently. They began to wonder why they were all treated so differently. They began to wonder why they could live in a world, why they could live worldwide, live in a beautiful house on 10 acres with a pool and a golf pad and go to private schools, but their brother didn't have a regular doctor or a therapist to help them. They began to understand that their brother was running away in an attempt to get out of a horrible situation that he was in. They began to become afraid of their father, citing his unpredictable behavior and of their mother for not stopping it. Nolan and Fiona will tell you that Ronan is kind, gentle, and caring. Ronan was on the ring tape speaking to his father. Everyone heard it. While Ronan's father was angry, challenging his behaviors, threatening to lock an ankle monitor on him, and threatening to take him out of school to homeschool him further within his locked room, Ruben answered his father respectfully, demurely, and never once talked back. That's the brother the fair daughters will tell you was present most of the time that they were together. For the girls, hearing that their father was parenting Ronan poorly and that it was Ronan's fault that he was locked in a room for hours upon hours was the most upsetting part for the Figueroa girls. The girls will tell you that their dad has a college degree and has traveled worldwide, helping others succeed. He has three children that he treats very differently. Nola was recently able to spend time with an uncle that she hadn't seen in years. This uncle physically resembled her father. The resemblance was so uncanny that it threw her back a little. She wasn't expecting anyone to look so much like her dad physically. She spent a few days with this uncle and his family. She learned that this uncle was very different than her father. He was kind, he was loving, he was attentive, he was personable, and he was gentle. When it was time for her to leave, she broke down into tears when she got into the car to return home. She was sobbing. Her question, how did my dad get it so wrong? Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you.